Britain's royal palaces. Symbols of power. Royal palaces are the bricks and mortar embodiment of what it means to be royal. And prestige. To see it is to believe it. It's a veritable feast for the eyes. Packed to the rafters with incredible secrets. From royal courtships to royal births to royal marriages and scandals, the palaces have played host to all of that. In this series, we step beyond the Golden Gates. We all see inside the palace walls. You feel as if you were being let into a secret world. Learn how these stunning buildings were constructed. This is a mad, eclectic vision of one man. Windsor was built to do battle. It's best not to get locked in one. You don't know when somebody's going to come and let you out. Unveil their spectacular artworks. The Royal Collection is simply stunning. The story of a tiara is like a spy mystery. We can only imagine how excited the Queen must have been. Delve into their gruesome histories. Frankly, if you're going to cut the head off a king, it's got to be done in a palace. And revisit recent events that have shaped the modern royal family. I could see that his legs were trapped. Camilla was one of the most unpopular women in the country. To see those images of the castle in flames, there was an emotional impact for the nation. This is The Secrets of the Royal Palaces. This time, we go behind the scenes with the builder who took on one of the most complex renovation jobs in the Windsor Castle restoration. We'd got two draftsmen drawing for the best part of a year before we even started to make anything. Get an inside look at the residents accommodating an ever-growing royal family, Kensington Palace. It was a very neat house once upon a time, but when monarchy got hold of it, they turned it into something of an architectural monster. Uncover the secrets thrown into the Queen's most iconic outfit. Hartnell actually added a wonderful secret detail, which is a little four-leaf shamrock. We discover the most bizarre palatial presence the Queen has ever received. She was given a crocodile, and Sir Martin Charteris, her private secretary, had to put it in his bath on Britannia. And we reveal the castle with the 16th century murder mystery that went horribly wrong. It was going to be the perfect crime. Killed on the blurb his house. No one will be any the wiser. The royal palaces serve as a permanent reminder of the history and influence of the British monarchy through the ages. But alongside the grand and ostentatious are those palaces that can often go unnoticed, built to blend in and to be a place for royals to call home. Across Hyde Park, some two miles west of Kensington Palace is big and it's old and it's rambling and it's got lots of apartments and houses there and it's perfect for the royal family the queen's got a lot of cousins and she needs to house them royals have occupied kensington palace for over three centuries and various generations have extended it to suit their needs architecturally it's a bit of a mess it's not the kind of unified vision that most palaces aspire to be it was a very neat house once upon a time but when monarchy got hold of it they turned it into something of an architectural monster. Its first royal inhabitants were William and Mary. As a result of the glorious revolution of 1688, they'd been invited from the Netherlands to replace the Catholic James II. They needed a new palace, but they needed it built quick and cheap. As a new king and queen, they didn't want to start building with great ostentation a project that would take years when their essential job was to control the nation and persuade them of the quality of their governance. Get it up, get it done, and let's get on with the business of running the country. They bought Nottingham House, a small villa in what was then the suburb of Kensington, and hired the most celebrated architect of the day, Sir Christopher Wren, to transform it into a palace. But Wren wasn't known for speed. His masterpiece, St Paul's Cathedral, was only halfway through its 35-year building programme. William and Mary wanted their palace in six months. Mary wanted a palace to be built around that old house by Christmas. And this was a phenomenal task to ask of Christopher Wren and all his collaborators. It was a bit of a bodge job, really. It was about trying to extend and build on what was already there and do so very, very quickly. With such a tight deadline, the builders cut corners. Kensington is notoriously bad 
be built. It's had a whole series of uh, structural uh, props and failures, and uh, Wren's masons just threw it up too quick. Five months into the project, these shortcuts led to tragedy. A vault collapsed, crushing a carpenter. And to have someone who's dead because of your design and workmanship, it racked Wren. He was found with his head in his hands in St. Paul's Cathedral. Mary then stepped in and said, my fault. To have a monarch feel responsible for deaths because of your building project is quite extraordinary. Rather pitifully, we know she wrote to William and said, it showed me the hand of God plainly in it, and I was truly humble. But there is a ruthless side to every queen, I think, because they were still in the new build by Christmas. Months. Wren had not only hit his deadline, but also his budget, thanks to a rather unregal building material. It was built in brick, which was sort of unfashionable material at the time. It's quite plain in its architecture. Parts of it just look like a street rather than a palace with, you know, long facades like any London street at the time. It's a bizarre building in many ways. Whilst Kensington Palace is home to young royals like William and Kate and their family, home for the Queen means Windsor. I think probably more than anywhere else, it is her home. This is where she's spent a huge amount of her childhood, adolescence, and now it is her haven. But at 11.30 a.m. on the 20th of November, 1992, the Queen's lifelong home was thrown into chaos when a small fire started in her private chapel in the northern corner of the castle. Windsor Castle was being rewired and there was a light which caught one of the heavy curtains and went up in flames immediately. And within minutes, the blaze had taken hold. In total, 225 firefighters were called to the scene, with 36 vehicles battling to save the palace. It could be seen for miles and miles around, and of course it seemed like there was a symbol of the monarchy burning. To see it in flames, I think, did have a, an emotional impact for many people in the UK. And no one felt that impact more than the Queen herself. The Queen was at Buckingham Palace and she was informed about the fire and she got to Windsor as soon as she possibly could. She arrived to find the palace she calls home burning out of control. It was clear to see that it was very distressing for her, watching the fire sweeping through and people desperately trying to tackle the blaze. As firefighters battle to bring the fire under control, the royal family leapt into action and helped organize a rescue mission to save the castle's many priceless treasures from the path of the raging flames. They formed a human chain masterminded by Prince Andrew, who knew every inch of that castle. As a child, he'd explored it, and he knew where all the secret back passages and everything else were. The Queen was shocked, but she is pragmatic. She gets on with it, and she realized that she had to be part of the effort to save what they could, and they did royal family were part of the chain there to get stuff out. We can reveal that in the end, only two works of art were lost in the fire. The blaze took 15 hours to bring under control. What had started as a small electrical void, the iconic St. George's Hall. In total, 115 rooms had been completely destroyed. It was so dramatic and so terribly sad. And the next day, the Queen surveyed the and as she walked through the charred remains of some of her possessions, she seemed like a little old lady, you know, who had lost something so treasured to her. Despite the devastation, the plan to rebuild started straight away. There was a competition for the redesign, won by a firm of architects who worked with oak specialists, Venables Brothers. We'd got two draftsmen drawing for the best part of a year before we even started to make anything. Initial reports suggested repairs would cost up to £60 million and it could take 10 years for the castle to dry out. Once you've got the job, you realise the size of the task that you've undertaken. And the question of exactly what form the reconstruction would take involved some controversial decisions. The Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh really were in charge of the restoration. They had a dilemma. Do they try and restore 
rooms back to exactly how they were? Could they even afford that? Or do they do something different? My blood pressure went up and I think I went grey in the process. Coming up on Secrets of the Royal Palaces, we reveal the secrets of the Tudor toilet. Going to the loo with Henry VIII was the top job in the Tudor court. And we go behind the scenes of the greatest historic building project ever attempted in 20th century Britain. The design that they came up with was absolutely stunning and probably the most complicated piece of oak joinery we've ever been involved in. Refurbishing royal palaces is a time-honoured tradition as young royals set up their homes. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge converted offices in Kensington Palace into their new apartment. Charles and Camilla spruced up Clarence House when they moved in. And Meghan and Harry reportedly spent £2.4 million overhauling Frogmore Cottage. But these renovations pale in comparison to the monumental task that faced the royals at Windsor Castle. In November 1992, a devastating fire ripped through Windsor Castle, destroying more than 100 rooms. From the ashes came a radical plan to rebuild the castle, a plan the royal family would personally take charge of. There was a restoration committee headed by Prince Philip, who was extremely good at organising... ...the centre of the devastating fire, the Royal Chapel. It had been completely destroyed, but rather than rebuild it, they came up with a whole new concept, the Octagonal Lantern Lobby. Chuck Venables and his brother were the Oak Specialists chosen to take on the job. The design that they came up with was absolutely stunning and probably the most complicated piece of oak joinery we've ever been involved in. The shaped ribs were so difficult to draw as they changed shape, we had to form them in plasticine. And there was no getting away from the palace residents. Prince Philip has always been very keen on design and he's extremely artistic. I'm sure he had plenty to say. I remember the first time I met Prince Philip on site. It was very pleasing to talk to him and see that he understood what we were doing and wanted to make sure that it was put back properly. After 18 months of hard work on the Lantern Lobby, all that remained to be fitted was the piece de resistance, the lantern itself. For Chuck, this was a heart-in-mouth moment. We'd never actually got the chance to check that the lantern or the lid would fit onto the roof, so we were all very, very nervous. To add to the pressure, the boss decided to check on their progress. The Queen opened a window and started to watch what was going on. So, of course, everybody was absolutely petrified. Finally, we got the message to say that it fitted. The room had completely transformed, but the royal family wanted to mark the site where the terrible fire had started. Prince Philip left his own mark on the new lobby. Some of the stained glass windows in the chapel were designed by Prince Philip and they depict some of the happening of the fire into the new fabric of the castle. A permanent reminder of the fire forever etched into the historic building. As well as the creation of the lantern lobby, all the state rooms have been carefully restored to their former glory. I think the restoration work at Windsor Castle has been done really well. The detail and the intricacy of the work is, is plain to see. Only five years to the day of the fire, the castle was reopened with a lavish ceremony. Reconstruction costs had come in at just over half the initial estimate. For recognition of their work, Chuck and his brother were invited to attend. The Queen walked straight up to them, say how much she loved the restoration work. This wasn't just about restoring the Queen's home, it was about preserving the heritage of this country in many ways. When you look at the pictures of what it was like after the fire and how it looks now, I think the restoration there has been fantastic. A glit 
wits and showmanship of a palace stateroom to the rather less glamorous, but no less essential, palace toilet. Every castle needs them, but in the past, royal toilets have held some extraordinary secrets. At Buckingham Palace, the Queen and her entourage have access to 78 modern bathrooms. In the time of Henry VIII, what you did in the privy said a lot about you. Henry VIII's court numbered about a thousand people from nobles to servants, and they created the most huge Tudor mountain of human waste you can imagine. And that's why so often Henry VIII was always moving palaces. He moved between Whitehall, Richmond, Hampton Court, Windsor Castle, so that one poor palace could have some time to be clean. And also in the summer, he went off to nobles' houses, so they had to sort out all this big, dirty, waste-creating court. And apparently, within a couple of days of the palace being filled by the courtiers, already the walls were black, it was sooty, it was grimy, and there was lots of unwashed bodies. But the worst of all was the human waste. Let's face it, Henry VIII, he liked those giant royal banquets every night, those Tudor meat feasts. And next morning, it was one massive rush for the uh, Tudor loo, and it was often called the Great Easement. And there was a real hierarchy of the toilet at Henry VIII's court. For the poor people, they had a group toilet. 14 or so people going to the loo together, and it was a bit like sitting together on a tube train, and all the waste fell into the moat, so it wasn't really very hygienic. The worst job of all was the royal gong scourer, or the royal toilet cleaner, all day long cleaning up toilets. The next one was the aristocracy, the nobles. They used private lavatories. At the top was Henry himself, who had a velvet box that travelled with him. And when Henry used his royal box, he was attended by what was known as the groom of the stool to help him onto the loo. And also any uh, ablutions that might be needed while Henry was using the toilet as Henry got more and more fat and gouty and ill. Every man wanted to be the groom of the stool because you got to talk to the king one-to-one -one in his intimate moment and you could tell him what your family wanted in terms of money. So going to the loo with Henry VIII was the top job in the Tudor court. Lucky, lucky you. Henry VIII's vast appetite for food was matched by his appetite for ostentatious palaces and he wasn't the only one. King George I was out to impress with his extravagant interior design decisions. Kensington Palace was created by Sir Christopher Wren by extending and redesigning Nottingham House. It was done on a budget and in a hurry. From outside, it looks unremarkable, but within its walls lies another world. Once inside, you must think, ah, so this is what it is. Is this only reveals itself to those privileged enough to come inside? It is a hidden labyrinth of diverse and, on occasion, wonderful rooms. These extraordinary interiors came about during the reign of King George I. Finding Kensington very agreeable, George decided against a dramatic remodelling. Instead, he opted to create the illusion of grandeur through some clever painting. Controversially, he hired painter William Kent, who'd never worked on a royal palace before. So I think the choice of William Kent is interesting. He undercuts the royal painter by several hundred pounds. And he's an outsider. He's a sign painter from Yorkshire. George's gamble on Kent paid off. For the last 300 years, visitors to the palace have been immediately immersed in the colourful world of the Georgian court. Kent, by 1724, had turned Wren's boring old wooden panelled staircase into a trompe l'oeil a trick of the eye feat of mural painting, in which you have a great arcade with all of the characters of court in their extraordinary dress. There are over 40 from the court, and uh, one of them is Kent himself. He shows himself with his mistress. The lively scene also includes some of the lowlier members of the court. Mehmet and Mustafa were Turkish prisoners of war who became trusted servants to George I. 
Mehmet was the only person who was to look after his piles. So that's a particular badge of honor. And you'll also spot Peter the wild boy, a child who was found wild foraging in the woods in George I's native Hanover. It's always been a bit of a game. Who were these players on the walls? And you can, of course, go and see them today and try and work it out for yourself. George now had rooms fit for a king. Mackenzie Melusina von der Schulenberg. She was a rather stick-like character, was known as the Maypole. The Maypole had to have new accommodation. So the masons arrived, the brickmakers, and up was thrown a new courtyard for her accommodation. With her self-contained apartment complete, the king would visit the Maypole, regular as clockwork, between 5 p.m. and 8 p.m. every day. In many ways, I suppose George I might be said to be a king who had his cake and wanted to eat it. So the layout, I guess, reflects this rather self-indulgent character of George. The creation of this courtyard is just another element thrown up in Kensington in a long series of revisions and afterthoughts and immediate needs. It was a labyrinth. Later generations have made good use of George's additions to Kensington Palace. In 1981, Charles and Diana moved into the same building that had been home to the Maple. After Diana's death, the apartments were converted into office space and staff quarters and haven't had a royal resident since. Coming up in Secrets of the Royal Palaces, we reveal the strange practices that went on in the Kensington Palace orangery. Queen Anne ended up using it as the place where she performed the age-old practice of touching for the Queen's evil. And we reveal the mysteries behind the Holyrood Palace murder. It gets a bit Cluedo, really, because beside Darnley was a chair, a rope, a knife and two dressing gowns. What was that for? Since the reign of Queen Victoria, Buckingham Palace has been the monarch's HQ, a symbol of the prestige of royalty. But that celebrated reputation was brought into question when one particular monarch moved in. Victoria's promiscuous son, Bertie, is known to have accommodated dozens of mistresses during his time at Buckingham Palace. So, Edward VII, he was Mr. Mistress. Let's put it that way. There was mistress after mistress. He was known as Edward the Caresser because there were so many of them. And in Europe, well, that's when Bertie indulged himself with courtesans and the best ladies of the night. There is in Paris a special chair he used. It's the weirdest looking thing you can imagine. You used to look at it thinking, how on earth did he use that? It was because by this point, he was hugely fat. So he basically used this chair for him to sit on and at least one lady beside him, probably two, they had to do all the work and he just sat there. The Playboy Prince of Wales became king in 1901 and took up his position at the grand and sophisticated Buckingham Palace. I think a lot of people hoped that when Bertie came to the throne, he'd stop it with all the girls and finally focus on his long-suffering wife, Queen Alexandra. But that wasn't the case. He just carried on with the mistresses. And one he particularly wouldn't let go of was Mrs. Alice Keppel. And what a coincidence, because she is actually the great-grandmother of Camilla, Duchess of Cornwall. Well, certainly... Miss Keppel was a very successful mistress to Edward VII. He was always devoted to her, even though there were other ladies around. And the king had a very short reign because he was pretty old and pretty ill when he came to the throne. And when he was finally dying, Alice was brought to his deathbed. I mean, unimaginable. Apparently the queen allowed this. The deathbed of Buckingham Palace should be so dignified, so solemn. And Alice gets hysterical, shouting, What's going to become of me? and gets hustled away because of all the hysteria. I think the biggest rebellion Edward VII could ever make against Victoria and her vision of the moral monarchy was to have his mistress at his deathbed in Buckingham Palace. Gone from one monarch to the next. With so many palaces to their name, it's up to the monarch to decide who lives in them. There's one palace that's proved incredibly popular with the family and houses more royals within its walls than any other. Kensington Palace. For over 300 years, it's been something of a royal housing estate. A Kensington Palace is, is one of the most populated palaces and also one of the most popular palaces with the royals. 
So you've got the Cambridges at apartment 1A, Princess Eugenie and her husband Jack Brooks back there, and the Gloucesters, I mean, the royals are very much packed in to Kensington Palace. It's like a little royal village in the centre of Kensington. Over the centuries, Palace has been altered to accommodate the extended royal family. But its most impressive building wasn't built for a royal. Its purpose was to grow fruit trees in. The Orangery was commissioned by Queen Anne in 1704. It was all about housing her exotic plants, in particular her citrus trees. She was very worried that they were going to get frostbite. But, you know, being a queen, she didn't just stick up a greenhouse. Anne instructed that her orangery should be both functional and beautiful. What she managed to achieve there was something harmonious, beautifully organised, very clearly functional, purposeful. It had ducts made of brick underneath the floor so that hot air would be swept in and would allow these oranges and citrus to grow throughout the winter. The interior had fine plaster work, the exterior very beautifully modelled brickworks. It's a building designed to be seen. Costs for the orangery more than doubled during construction. Inside, elaborate decorations were created by celebrated woodcarver Grinling Gibbons. To see it is to believe it. It's absolutely delightful. It's a, a veritable feast for the eyes. So lovely was Queen Anne's new orangery that she found it too good to use only for gardening. She ended up using it as a ballroom and also as the place where she performed the age-old practice of touching for the Queen's evil. The Queen's evil was a name given to a disease called scrofula, which affects the lymph glands, and it, you have a swollen neck, that's the main symptom. And it's thought that it could be cured by contact with uh, monarchs, uh, because they are gods appointed on Earth. The orangery presented the perfect location for Anne to meet with the sick without inviting them into her home. You can actually go present yourself with your ailment, and she would, you know, heal you, make you better, simply by being a queen and touching you. The Hanoverian monarchs that followed Anne had little interest in curing the sick. They turned the orangery into a party venue, which it still is to this little heiress, Nikki Hilton, holding her wedding reception there. The palace orangery is as fashionable as it ever was. From parties to the young royals choosing to make Kensington their home, it's a palace that will be forever linked with the trendy and chic side of royal life. The royal palaces, their reputations have been forged out of dark and sinister secrets. Holyrood Palace in Edinburgh is stained by the turbulent reign of Mary Queen of Scots. 1567, the 10th of February, there is the biggest murder mystery in Scottish royal history. Central to this whodunit is Lord Darnley, Mary's deceitful and often estranged second husband. Lord Darnley is recuperating from an illness, possibly sick. He's in a house just by the city walls, and late one night, there was a massive explosion. This huge explosion that rocked all Edinburgh woke Mary up in Holyrood House, and Darnley's house had been entirely blown up. It was going to be the perfect crime. Kill Darnley, blow up his house. No one would be any the wiser, but Darnley managed to escape. And there's an amazing map drawn by the spies at the time show you exactly what happened. Darnley managed to get away to the nearby orchard and there he is found dead with his servant. And now it gets a bit Cluedo really because beside Darnley was a chair, a rope, a knife and two dressing gowns. What was that for? Well, what we think happened is that Darnley heard the baddies coming to kill him and he used the rope and the chair to get out of the window to dagger with him to stab and the dressing gown because he was just wearing his nightshirt, as was his servant. So, you know, you want to be a bit more dressed when you're fighting off some baddies. But the ruffians were too quick for him. They smothered him and his servant in the orchard and then they all ran off. Mary, Queen of Scots, was herself suspected of the crime. Years later, the murder of Darnley was still being blamed on inhabitants of Holyrood. During the Victorian period, the maids said to visitors that there was a Darnley bloodstain, and they used to charge visitors a couple of pennies to go and look at this Darnley bloodstain, but actually, they'd put it on themselves. 
So if you ever go to Holyrood House and you're offered a chance to see the Darnley bloodstain, it's going to be made out of red food colouring. Tourists still flock to Holyrood today for a closer look at the palace's fascinating secrets. 400 miles south of Buckingham Palace, the Grand State, a chance to witness firsthand the iconic riches housed within. Clothing is such an important part of the major events in our lives, and when it's done well, it communicates everything that is really important at that precise moment to the wearer and to the occasion. The 2nd of June, 1953, Elizabeth II's coronation. For the first time, the whole ceremony, as well as the famous appearance on the Buckingham Palace balcony, would be televised. With the eyes of the world on her, it was essential she had the right dress. A dress so special, it would have secrets sewn into its very fabric. The Queen's coronation dress is just stunning. There's no other way to describe it. It was made by the leading British couturist at the time, Norman Hartnell. Elizabeth knew this dress would go down in history and she proved a very hands-on client. The four national emblems of England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales were already going to be included. The Queen came up with a rather wonderful suggestion to also include emblems for each of the dominions over which she was becoming Queen. You can make out the maple leaf of Canada, the wattle of Australia, you can see the lotus flower of India and then the wheat sheaves of Pakistan. The whole dress becomes a true symbol of the reach of Queen Elizabeth II. Hartnell loved the young Queen's ideas, but they didn't see eye to eye on everything. Originally, Hartnell represented Wales with the emblem of the daffodil, and he was slightly put out when he was asked to replace it with the rather less glamorous but more official Welsh symbol of the leek. Despite the Queen's attention to detail, there was one secret that Hartnell managed to sneak past her. Unknown to the Queen, Hartnell actually added a wonderful secret detail, which was a little four-leaf shamrock, which he placed on her left skirt, just underneath where her hand would be resting in the ceremony. A secret message from the designer to the Queen on the dress that would be immortalised as part of the coronation ceremony. And the day would be complete when Elizabeth II stepped out onto the famous Buckingham Palace balcony to wave to a male packed with her subjects. The glitter, the glamour, just the pure historicity of it all must have been magnificent. The dress is now part of the royal collection displayed at Buckingham Palace, a palace so integral to its story. Coming up on Secrets of the Royal Palaces, step inside the top secret dressing rooms of Elizabeth I. These were her secret spaces where the makeup went within the palaces. The gift was a massive six-foot-long grasshopper made by the French surrealist artist Francois Xavier Lalanne. Throughout history, royal palaces have been the site of official ceremonies and royal duties. But when the crowds depart and the cameras turn off, it's a different story. They become spaces where the monarch can put their feet up and truly be themselves. Space one particular queen would have been very grateful for. Elizabeth I, she's one of our most recognisable English monarchs. Bright red hair, this white skin, extravagantly dressed. Her image was so vital to her. She knew that people had to see the Queen as majestic, as perfect, as healthy. Because if the Queen wasn't beautiful and healthy, it was thought that the kingdom wouldn't be beautiful and healthy. Protecting and preserving the regal image of the Queen became a top secret operation. Her palaces on the Thames, Windsor, Hampton Court, Richmond, Whitehall, whichever palace the Queen was holding court at, she had a suite of rooms called the Privy Lodgings, each more secluded from the court than the last. These were her secret spaces where the dress, where the makeup went on and no man could go. Only her private ladies went with her and they helped her with her makeup. And the secret of what lay behind Elizabeth I's incredible image was one not to be revealed. Elizabeth's makeup was incredibly toxic. You know, it would be completely illegal today. What she used to use to whiten the skin as a kind of face mask came from what's known as Venetian cerulean. 
clothes made of lead and vinegar. And on top of this, she wore a rouge, which was lead carbonate and lead hydroxide. And then she had these lipsticks made from ground alabaster. So she was ingesting all this toxic material through the skin. And we know now that these cause all kinds of side effects, digestive effects, insomnia, uh, headaches and respiratory problems. She died aged 69, and I do wonder whether some of it hastened her death and made it more painful. Whilst monarchs through the ages have felt the pressure and politics of keeping up with royal expectations, it's certainly a job that comes with some impressive perks. Gifts are part and parcel of being a royal. Cellars and storerooms at Buckingham Palace and Windsor are full of trinkets and oddities given to the Queen and her family over the years. One of the times when gifts are exchanged are during a state visit. When you think that she's been on the throne over 70 years and each year there's been at least two state visits, you can imagine the amount of things that she's collected. A treasure trove of wonderful and sometimes weird gifts. Over the years, the Queen has received some really bizarre gifts, from 500 tins of pineapple to horse semen, which was probably quite ideal for someone who is interested in breeding horses. She's also been given a whole host of exotic animals. One occasion she was given a crocodile and Sir Martin Charteris, her private secretary, had to put it in his bath on Britannia. In 1972, the president of Cameroon even sent the queen an elephant called Jumbo, which was put on a plane and flown over to Britain. One thing you don't want to do is give her something she's already got. One man didn't have to worry about that. The president of France, Georges Pompidou, was spearheading a project to open a new museum of modern art. So naturally, he wanted to give Prince Philip a suitably modern gift. And what says modern more? than a gigantic insect. Behold, the grasshopper. Made by the French surrealist artist Francois Xavier Lalanne. It's made of brass and iron and porcelain. Only two of them were ever created and the other version was sold at auction in 2018 for $1.6 million. It's not only a work of art. This bizarre animal has a practical purpose. It is indeed a fully functioning air-conditioned bar and Insects' wings actually open out to become a drinks table. It's an incredibly fun period piece from the 70s when having your own portable bar would have been the absolute height of cool. Today, the grasshopper is still standing guard at the entrance to the royal private apartments at Windsor Castle. Prince Philip was absolutely thrilled with it and he wanted to put it in the drawing room and he asked the superintendent whether he thought that was a good idea and I remember the superintendent telling me, he said, uh, well, sir, perhaps by the swimming pool, might that not be more appropriate? The bold gift idea was clearly a huge hit. Anyone for a grasshopper cocktail? Next time, we go inside Holyrood to reveal the true story of Mary, Queen of Scots. The plays, the films that have been made about her extraordinary life, it's personified in that Northwest Tower. We uncover a royal fake that could be worth a fortune. Queen's copy was actually worth £50 million. And a case of history repeating itself at Buckingham Palace. It was around 30 years before that Harry was seen on the balcony doing exactly the same thing to his cousin, Princess Beatrice. <laughs>